The most important tool in any shop is your music. How else are you going to get your dance moves in? Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Usually, if someone wants to get into hand tools, the first plane they think they need to buy is a block plane or a smoothing plane. Um, and in all honesty, those are probably the least used tools that I have in a full hand tool shop. But for a hand tool person, a smoothing plane might be a good idea. It is one way, if you learn how to set it up, it can treat you very well. The problem is, it is difficult to set up and it is easier to learn some of the other methods of planing before you get into smoothing. So I want to kind of talk today about what is a smoothing plane um, and what sets it apart from some of the other planes in your shop. So let's take a look at this. So what is a smoothing plane? Now a lot of people are going to tell you a smoothing plane is a number four. A number four is a smoothing plane. And then other people are going to say no, 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 no. A smoothing plane is a number three. And then you're going to find some people that say no, you need a number four and a half for a smoothing plane. And then you're going to have a few people say no, a number five is actually a great smoothing plane. Or a block plane is a great smoothing plane. Um, and so really which one is a smoothing plane? The truth of the matter is, a smoothing plane is the plane that you pick up when you want to smooth a board. It is a plane that is set up to do smoothing correctly. Uh, it's nothing particular about the number on the plane. You can use whatever one you want, although different planes are going to have different aspects to how the uh, board is smoothed out. So I really want to go through what actually makes a good smoothing plane. And this is really kind of my opinion because everyone you talk to is going to have a slightly different view of what they like in a smoothing plane. So I'm going to give you some of the parameters so that you can pick out what you want in a smoothing plane. Now, in my opinion, there are four things that make up a smoothing plane. Number one, the size of the, small, the sole. How wide is it and how long is it? Number two, how small is the mouth? So from the very tip of the blade to the front of the mouth, how wide is that opening? Number three, how sharp is your blade? <laughs> now that's kind of an open question because you want a sharp blade for most any action with a plane, but with a smoothing plane it's very important. And then number four, how closely is your chip breaker set? And really once you get those four parameters set up, you can make just about any plane smooth a board. So let's go through these one at a time. Number one, the size of the, the sole. Now for simplicity's sake, I'm going to remove the number five and the block plane from this list uh, because really there are very, very few people who like these for smoothing. Uh, their sole size is just either too large or uh, too small to handle well for smoothing. So I'm gonna be basically talking about the three, the four, and the four and a half. As most people, that's what they want. Now the four and the four and a half are between nine and nine and a half inches long. Um, sometimes up to 10 inches, but most of the time they're about nine and a half inches long. The number three is less than nine, usually about eight and a half, uh, sometimes as small as seven and a half, uh, depending upon your maker, as uh, different companies had slightly different sizes to set them apart. The four and a half is about three inches wide, whereas the four is just a little over two inches wide. And then the number three is usually right about two inches, maybe just a hair larger than two inches in the sole. So why is the sole size important? Well, to give you an idea, if I want to joint this board, I'm going to use a you know, number six, number seven, number eight, um, usually something that is about half the length of the board or close thereto. And this large, long sole will tell me if the board is flat. So as I run it all the way along the board, if it isn't flat, uh, any low spot, the blade is going to skip over it. Any high spot, it's going to take that off. Whereas if I use a number four on this, the number four is going to ride up and down the hills and valleys of the board. And for a smoothing plane, that's really kind of what you're looking for. Because you're not looking at jointing something, you're just wanting to get that perfect finish surface on it. You're going to be taking off a very small amount, usually something that you can't even feel with your own hand. And if there is a slight dip in the board or something that's bent over time, having a smoothing plane that can ride with those valleys um, is very, very useful. So some people say, because the number three has a much smaller sole, it's better to use that because it will ride with a little more. Whereas some people say, you know, the number four and a half is great because it's a little wider. So you can cover more of a board if you're doing the surface. And it's still short enough that it can ride with those, with those movements a little. 
And so it's kind of something you have to find out. Personally, um, it depends on the board, but usually I'm gonna be using my number four for smoothing. Occasionally, I will pick up the number three um, if I know the board has a little bit more movement in it than I normally like. So the other thing that's very important with the sole of a plane for smoothing is its burnishing action. So basically once the blade cuts it, the rest of the sole will actually smooth and burnish the surface. And you can get a really nice surface with that. And that's why um, I don't generally use a card scraper as the last thing to touch the wood. Um, but sometimes I do, if the wood is very, very figured, this is the only thing that will work on it. But the problem is the sole is so small that I don't get a whole lot of burnishing action on there. Um, the 81, the next step up from the 80, has a wooden sole on it that burnishes uh, far better than this one would. But that is also why a lot of people are very adamant about using a wooden plane for smoothing. The wooden sole actually burnishes a good bit better than the steel will. And you get a, a really nice buttery surface with this. So if you get a well-tuned wooden smoothing plane, it can provide a really, really nice glass smooth surface. The problem is they're a little bit more tricky to turn to tune, and they're not always best for the beginning hand tool woodworker. Though once you learn how to set one of these up, they are great to have on hand and leave you with an amazing surface. Now let's move on to the next aspect, and that is how small is your mouth? Um, and from this point on, we're going to be talking about uh, preventing chip out in the board. We want to make sure that we're not tearing up the board because usually this is the last thing that touches the wood so we want to leave a perfectly smooth clean surface um, and so having a small mouth helps remedy some of the tear out you'd have. Basically if the mouth is small enough your tear out will only be as long as your mouth is open because the sole in front of the blade is still going to be holding those chips down so that when the blade pops them up the mouth will actually break them uh, so that you're not tearing out far in front of it. The chip breaker also does something very similar. As the wood comes up the blade, so if you have the blade here, as the wood comes up the blade and it runs out, usually it's going to be like a, chip, a chisel trying to split out the fibers in front of it. Whereas the chip breaker, it comes up the blade and hits the chip breaker and it immediately deflects up and that's going to break the chip. Um, now there's a lot of controversy back and forth, but basically the closer you can set the chip breaker to the front of the blade, the sooner it's going to break those chips. And so usually I like to say put the chip breaker as close to the tip as you can on a smoothing plane. For most every other plane out there, the chip breaker really is kind of pointless uh, for general use. So I like to back the chip breaker up to like a, a sixteenth or even as much as like an eighth. The last item on the list is how sharp is your blade? And really this is something that is going to throw a lot of people for a loop because they think when you get a blade from the store it's going to be sharp. And unless you're buying from like Hawk or something like that, the blade is usually never going to be really sharp. Um, and some people say you have to take it up to like a 20,000 grit or 16,000 grit stone. And if you're sticking with like Shapton stones, then yes, you want to take it up to around a 16,000 grit or so. But if you're using a strop, usually I take it to about a 1200 and then use a strop on it and it does fairly well. Um, basically, I'm looking for something that I can shave the hairs on my arm. Um, I find a lot of people have a hard time with the paper test. Um, so I like shaving hairs on my arm just to test it. And if I get a nice clean cut, and I'm sliding it along there and it's taking off every single hair, then I know it's perfectly sharp. If I know it's taking one or two out of ten hairs, then I probably want to take it back and clean it up again. But that's my personal test for how sharp is your blade. The one other item that a smoother might have that some people are very particular about is a cambered iron. And, and if you go to a scrub plane or a four plane, um, you'll see that the iron is actually slightly rounded. Let me see if I can get that on there might be able to see that there, where the iron is round, is higher up here than it is out here on the edges. And some people like that because it gives you a narrow space in the middle where you can take very little. The problem with that is you start to get a feeling for it and some people like that rough feeling on the surface that, that kind of wave from having a cambered iron. And some people really don't like that. They want a perfectly smooth and flat surface. Uh, personally, for my smoothing planes, um, they are perfectly flat all the way along the edge, except for the last eighth inch to quarter inch is rounded slightly so that they don't, so that the corner of the blade doesn't nick into the surface. So it's slightly rounded there. 
Now you may have noticed that I'm not actually going into the how to set up a smoothing plane yet. I'm going to be doing a whole other video on that, otherwise this one would be an extremely long video. I just want to talk about what are the components of a smoothing plane and what are you going to be looking for in it. And really when it comes down to picking what you want for your smoothing plane, it's going to be about testing things out and finding what do you want your finished surface to be? Do you want your finished surface to have a bit of a wave in it? Um, do you want your, per your finished surface to be dead flat? Um, are you the type of person who wants to get things done quickly? Or are you wanting to do very fine and little bit of work here and there? Um, it's going to be something that is up to you. So I'll, the best piece of advice I can get is get your hands on a few and try them out. If you can't do that, usually you're not going to go wrong with a number four. It's kind of like the middle ground for everything. Um, but if you get your hands on any one of these, they will work as a smoothing plane as long as they're set up correctly and do what you want them to do. So I hope you like this. It was a bit of information. I'll be having another video coming out later this week. Um, if it is out, it'll be right here. And that will be talking more about how do you actually set up the smoothing plane and uh, the little details that go into making this work very well, even in rough figured wood. So we'll take a look at that in a little bit. I hope you liked the video. If you did, please hit like and think about subscribing. I want to say a huge thank you to the, to the patrons on Patreon. Um, you guys have been an incredible encouragement to me, and thank you for that. If you did like this video, feel free to check out one of the others. And until next time, have a wonderful day.